All right. Can everybody hear me? Okay. And you can hear me. That's good. Um, well, welcome. I am really glad to see everybody here. It's 4 o'clock on a Friday. The weather is actually kind of nice outside, and I'm really kind of surprised everybody wants to talk about law. Or maybe you don't want to be here. You just know that you should be here. Um, I love this stuff, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Chris Brown. I'll start things off. Uh, actually, first, uh, she handed out some evaluations. Uh, I think you're supposed to fill those out, I guess, at the end of the presentation, so hopefully I do a good job. Uh, if not, you can tell me. Um, I'll start out briefly by talking about who I am. Uh, uh, my name is Chris Brown. I'm an attorney. So I started out uh, doing music business actually went to undergrad in Nashville went up to New York City worked at a recording studio had a lot of fun but ultimately decided at that time uh, that I wanted to go to law school never in my life had I ever thought about going to law school but it just kind of hit me one night at two o'clock in the morning and I told my fiance hey I'm gonna go to law school and so here I am um, I went to uh, UMKC law right down the street went to work for a firm downtown got bored after a few years and so I quit uh, I left and I actually made a company that now makes websites for law firms so I actually know quite a bit about what all of you do we, we have a, a multi-site WordPress install and we build solo and small firm websites. I'm probably not as good as you. Actually, I'm not as good as you, but at least I understand the concepts of what you're doing. Um, at the same time, though, uh, I knew that I did not want to give up practicing law, and so I created my own law firm, Venture Legal. And today I represent uh, tech startups, freelancers, and small businesses. Uh, my focus is solely on transactional work. I don't do any litigation. I don't do any estate planning. Um, if you need me to pay off your porn star mistress, I won't do that either. Um, I am very narrowly focused on transactional work for mostly creative people. Um, before I get too deep here, uh, I do have a bunch of ebooks on my website, venturelegalkc.com forward slash ebooks. You might want to check those out. There's one in particular specifically on freelancing, uh, how to be a successful freelancer, and that one you can find at that link as well. A lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today will be uh, in that ebook right there. In fact, the flow of that ebook kind of tracks what we're talking about today. Um, a few quick general disclaimers. I am a lawyer, so I have to say these things. Um, don't do anything stupid, right? This is general advice. Nothing in here is specific for you. Your situation is probably going to be unique and different. However, for the most part, what you're doing uh, will fall in line with what I talk about today. Uh, note, look around. This isn't private. This isn't confidential. So if you say anything to me in this meeting uh, or in this presentation, everybody around you is going to hear it. Uh, and then the last thing is I'm not your lawyer. Uh, I don't think any of my clients are here. If there are, uh, you're not my client for the next hour. Uh, so now that's the boring stuff out of the way. Um, before I jump too far into what we're going to talk about, I wanted to ask a few questions. Um, how many of you are currently freelancing on your own? Most of you, good. How many of you work for another company, an agency or whatever? A few of you, do you guys moonlight on, or how many of you moonlight outside of that agency? So most of them. Um, do you guys have LLCs? How many of you have an LLC? Not yet. Not yet, it's only a couple. So most of you just operate under your own name, right? I'm an S-Corp. An S-Corp, okay. Uh, but otherwise, most of you operate just under your own name. You might have a DBA or a fictitious name, but you're a sole proprietor. Okay, that's helpful for me. Um, so here's what we're going to talk through. I'm going to spend about five minutes on each section, and then at the end we can do some Q&A. Uh, in my experience, I've talked here at WordCamp twice, and both times there's a million questions. So what I did was I took my presentation and trimmed out everything that is kind of irrelevant to focus on just the core important stuff, and that way I gave a plenty of time for Q&A. Feel free to ask questions at any point. Before I move on to each section, I will stop and ask if you have any questions so we can at least try to stay on topic. Um, but ask questions whenever. At the end, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. And if you want to ask me a private question when we're done, uh, feel free to come up and chat. I'll stay around for a little while. Um, OK, so let's start. We're going to talk first about starting and running an LLC. Uh, there's basically three ways that you can set up your company. First, which is what most of you are, it sounds like, is a sole proprietorship. Uh, that's by far the easiest way to operate. Um, you just use your own name. You can get a DBA or a fictitious name if you want to. It's really dirt simple. Uh, the tax filings are simple. We'll come back to taxes in a little bit. Uh, it's just simple, right? There's some downsides, though. You're personally liable for everything that happens. So you might want to consider forming an LLC, and I'll come back to why in a few minutes. The next step up is if you operate with more than one person. Actually, does anybody in here have business partners, like owners, co-owners? OK, that makes this really easy. If you did, partnerships are a lot like sole proprietorships, the difference being there's more than one person. The other difference being, you see that white box? That represents the fact that it's actually a business entity, so it can own property, it can sue people, it can be sued. It's a business entity, regardless if you file something with the Secretary of State or not. 
The biggest downside to being a partnership is you're liable for everything that happens through the company and you're liable for everything that your business partner does too, right? So in this example, if that nice looking dude went out and bought five new MacBook Pros and that nice looking lady said, what the hell are you doing? I don't wanna own five my MacBook Pros, we can't afford that, she's liable not only through the company, but personally. So if they defaulted on that loan to buy those MacBooks, she'd be personally liable and Apple could go after her, her own personal wages, her car, her house, or whatever. You really don't want to do that. So just avoid creating partnerships. The next level up would be LLCs and corporations, which are way more common. Uh, I won't talk too much about corporations today because they're mostly irrelevant for you guys. I doubt any of you would form a corporation. If you formed an S Corp, you might have, had, did you form a corporation? Do you mind if I ask? I did. Okay, but then you elected an S Corp? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, the reason most people don't want to be a corporation is a tax reason, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, so most people today pick LLC. However, you do do a corporation today, and there are some benefits there. Uh, the big thing you want to do is make an S-Corp tax election for saving money, ultimately. Anyway, the point is when you form that company all the way over there, what you're doing at that point is creating a company that is separate and independent from you as an owner. right? So I, in that example, I moved the two people up out of the company. So the company might be liable for something. So if the cafe sells really hot coffee, it swells in somebody and somebody sues the cafe, they could take all the cafe's money, they could shut down the cafe, but those two owners up there, they're personally protected, right? So you can't go after their personal assets. Uh, you cannot garnish their wages if they have a different job. Now, they'll still be liable if they did something wrong, if they were negligent, you know, if they spilt the coffee on somebody, uh, but they're not gonna be liable just simply because the cafe did something wrong. Generally speaking, I really like LLCs. I think it's the best way to go. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, oh, actually, first we'll talk about do you need it? That's a common question I hear freelancers asking. The number one reason, which is at the top there, is liability purposes, like I mentioned before. So if you have anyone doing work for you as an employee or more likely as a subcontractor, then you should form an LLC. The reason being the liability. So if that subcontractor does something wrong, the limited liability that you get from the LLC can protect you. You know, your subcontractor will still be liable if they do something wrong. Your LLC will still be liable, but you individually will not be. So your personal assets are protected. Um, if you want to add owners to your company or sell it someday, it's usually a good idea to form an LLC. Sometimes it can help your clients if you have an LLC because what you don't want or what your client doesn't want is for the IRS to say that you're really their employee. Because if you're an employee, they have to do employment withholdings. And so by forming an LLC, it actually helps your client out. And then the last reason I say is it just makes you look a little bit more like a business. So depending on who your client base is, if you're selling to mom and pop stores, maybe not, that doesn't matter. If you're selling to Hallmark, maybe they want to work with an LLC and not a person. Um, if you're selling to a huge company like Cerner, having an LLC might really help you. It's not a hard rule, but it just might help. Okay, so if you do decide to form an LLC, here's the basic five steps of how you want to do it. First thing that you do, and by far the most important, it is you, you file articles of organization with the Secretary of State. You can do this in any state in the country, but realistically, you're probably gonna do it in the state that you live and work in. If you live and work in different states, like you live in Kansas but work in Missouri, you could basically pick either one. Uh, for the most part, at least for what you're doing, it's gonna more or less be the same. Uh, next thing that you wanna do is draft an operating agreement. If you're by yourself, a solo founder, this could be just a two or three page document. It outlines a few simple rules for your company. If you have co-founders, then you need a much more elaborate operating agreement that talks about what happens if somebody dies or what happens if somebody gets hit by a bus, what happens if somebody wants to sell their ownership interest, all these various contingency scenarios. In that situation, it's probably like 20 pages but you don't need to go that far if it's just you by yourself. Uh, then you need to get an EIN from the IRS. Uh, even if you're a sole proprietor, you can still get an EIN, and it's probably a good idea so you can protect your social security number. The EIN is basically like a social security number in the sense that it serves as an identification number for your company. So whenever you're working with a third party, whenever you open a bank account, whenever you do any of those things, they're gonna ask for your EIN. And if you're by yourself a sole proprietor, you'd be way better off giving out your EIN than your social security number. Um, for obvious reasons. Uh, fourth step, open a bank account. You always want to get a separate bank account for your business. Even if you're a sole proprietor, you still want to get a separate bank account just for income and expense tracking. Um, you never want to co-mingle your money between your personal assets, your personal money, and your business assets for liability purposes. And then the last thing is file any reports if required. So if you have an LLC in Kansas, you have to file a report every year, or if you elect, you can do it every other year. It costs like 20 bucks or 40 bucks, depending on how you file. If you live in, or if your Missouri is formed in Missouri, you don't have to do that. So that's one small benefit of Missouri. Um, 
big thing there is if you forget to file your annual report, and this is actually a really big deal, they will administratively dissolve your LLC. And then you have a certain window of time to reinstate your LLC, which is a big pain. And then if you wait till after that date, you literally can't revive it. You have to start a new LLC, and that's just a whole bunch of headaches. So don't forget about annual reports if you're subject to them. Okay, that's companies. Went through that pretty quickly. Any questions on LLCs? Yeah. You talked to me about the separation of liability for an LLC. Yeah. Um, I've observed a couple of situations though where uh, the owners were actively operating their LLC and a lawsuit is filed against both the LLC and the named individuals. Yeah, so if you're, if you go talk to a lawyer and you say I need to sue somebody, that lawyer is going to name every single person they can think of in the lawsuit. That's rule number one. They just do that by default. And then they let the defendant figure out who should get sued. Well, the defendant slash the judge. Um, if you did everything right, you'd be able to go to the judge on day one and say, Judge, this is a liability for my company, not me. I didn't do anything wrong. Please dismiss me from this lawsuit. You'll usually get dismissed. Reasons you wouldn't get dismissed are if you're the one who did whatever that wrong thing was. You know, if you're the one who spilt the coffee, you're still liable. You can't say, oh, I have an LLC. It doesn't work. Um, other reasons, if you commingle your money, if you don't have an operating agreement, if you haven't been filing your annual reports, if you don't follow those corporate formalities, then they can pierce the veil is what they call it, and come after you as an individual, and you don't want to do that. That's why it's important to follow all those little silly steps. They seem really silly. It's like, why do you need an operating agreement when you're by yourself? But that's one of the reasons. It's not rock solid. It's not like if you have the operating agreement or don't have it, that that decides everything, but it's just one of multiple factors. So, yeah? Um, this might not be something you want to address right now, but I was just kind of curious. What if you form an LLC like in one state, but you decide you want to move to another one? Oh, say, yeah. I, want, I formed it in Kansas and want to move to Kansas. Yeah, uh, you probably want to move the company. You just register to do business in a different state. So if you have an LLC in one state, but you do business in multiple states, you have to register in all the states that you do business in. Being in Kansas City, it's hard. Like if you have a, I, I live and work in Missouri, but occasionally I go to Kansas for client meetings, right? So do I do business there or not? I've come to the conclusion that I don't. I don't go there enough to justify filing there. I am registered as a lawyer there, but my LLC is not registered there. Uh, if you had an office there, if you have employees there, if you go there on a weekly basis, then you're starting to have more connections to that state and you have to register there. So, I mean, you just, okay, so you just more or less, you, I mean, if you actually move or something, then you just, uh, Start a new LLC in Missouri and just let the, I mean, just close the Oh, you could LLC. do that. I wouldn't do that. I would probably so like if I were to move to Kansas, I would just register as doing business in Kansas, which means I have to pay an extra fee. I think it's 150 bucks, and then you pay at 20 bucks a year. But my Missouri LLC would remain active, and then I would just be doing business in Kansas. What um, if I can you could still keep the LLC. It's, it just kind of becomes, like if you're, say you move to Washington State and you're never coming back here, uh, you could, but realistically what you'd be better off doing probably is forming a new LLC in Washington State and then merging your Missouri one into it so everything transfers with it. Or if you don't have many assets and you don't have many contracts out there, you could just shut down the Missouri one and start fresh. You should talk to a lawyer about your specific situation because it would heavily influence what decision you might make. Yeah. Now, an LLC doesn't necessarily mean a business license. So a mm, lot of no. cities have a different business license. If yes. you sell your products online, do you only have to have a business license like for where you live or if you send it to other like mm. maybe cities or whatever? That's a little bit blurry right now. Uh, I, I know for tax purposes you only have to charge sales tax if you sell products to the same in the same state that you're shipping them from. But that's all in flux, and Congress is looking at that right now about making some federal laws about that. I don't know the exact answer for you. So the business um, license only covers the tax part? Oh, no, no, no. I'm just saying I, I, I know the tax part. The business license, in theory, you have to get a business license in any city that you transact business in. But if you're just selling goods online, I would hesitate to say that you're transacting business in that city just because you're shipping there. It'd be really impractical for you to register in every city. Right. That's, I wouldn't do that. So you're covered if you have a business license where you live. Uh, where you if work. If you're selling online, do you still need to have the business license? You should. Okay. Um, honestly, I didn't get my business license. Can you turn the videotape off for a second? Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get my business license for the first like two years of my law firm. I just never got around to it, and the city wasn't very happy about it. But like the penalties are small, and I just 
just didn't get around to it. But I did get malpractice and set up all the legal stuff that's really important. Uh, so I mean, business licenses are important. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm just saying that those are relatively low on the list of priorities. So yeah. Is there anything different if you have clients, say, in Canada, as well as your local clients? Um, I don't know. I'm not a Canadian lawyer. I don't really know. Um, I have done a little bit of international law. Um, if you do a lot of work in Canada, I would probably talk to somebody that does know the answer to that. If you just occasionally do work for them, like website design work for clients in Canada, eh, you may not need to worry about it quite yet. If you hire a Canadian subcontractor, yeah, you need to figure out something for employees or whatever. So, yeah, we got last question on this, but we can come back at the end to more of this. Yeah, you can address this later if it makes more sense. But um, I was going to say, uh, like your LLC, for numerous reasons, I actually don't want to necessarily have the LLC be based at my house, even though it is kind of. Oh, sure. Prison. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know if there was any, any other things I had to worry about that. I don't know. I've heard of people actually like getting an address at, I don't know, the UPS store or something, something like that. Or yeah, like yeah. Things like that that actually have like a real looking address for their LLC that's not mm -hmm. their house. There's two things there. One is your business address, which is what you would have people mailing checks to or whatever, and that's where you might get like a UPS store box or if you work out of like a co-working place, like I work out of WeWork, so I have an address there, which is great. Um, the other component of that, which is uh, is the registered agent address, that's where official lawsuits get mailed. Most of my clients use their home address uh, just because they don't feel like paying somebody to do this for them, but some of my clients want to maintain that privacy. They don't want their address out there, especially some of my female clients that um, are afraid of like harassers and stuff. They pay a company every year, uh, the one that I use the most, they charge, um, I think it's 120 bucks a year, and they will serve for you, it's called Northwest Registered Agent, uh, and they will serve as a registered agent for you, so all the official mail goes to them, and if they get a lawsuit or any other official government mail, they will open it, scan it, and send it to you, which is awesome. They also collect all your junk mail and throw it away, because when you register as a registered agent, you'll get a ton of junk mail, like pens and giveaways and just stuff. Um, okay, so we can come back to that in a little bit. I want to make sure we get through everything else, though. Um, so next thing that we're going to talk about is taxation. Who wants to talk about taxation at 4.15 on a Friday? Um, so first up is some practical accounting tips. I've been running my own businesses now for four years, so I've learned a lot about just kind of day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, first thing is select a good bank. Talk to your bank before you open your account to understand how they work. Find out if they have a good mobile app, if that's important to you, including depositing checks on the mobile app. Find out if they have limits of how much you can deposit through the app. Uh, make sure that they have... Uh, good syncing capabilities whatever with whatever cloud-based accounting software you use, uh, assuming you use a cloud-based one, which is what I recommend. There's two that I really like, Xero.com, it's X-E-R-O.com, and uh, FreshBooks, which is probably what most of you have heard of. They allow you to keep track of your income and your expenses really easily, so at the end of the year, it's easier to do your tax return. Uh, do this stuff on a weekly basis. Keep your books uh, clean and reconciled on a weekly basis. It's really important not to get behind on that. Uh, you can, to help you do that, you can set up a good chart of accounts. So for example, the way I do it is my uh, marketing expenditures, I have separated out to marketing subscription and marketing non-subscription. So I put MailChimp, um, whatever else I have, like Adobe Stock, um, I put all that stuff on marketing subscription and then on my non-subscription stuff, like I had a barbecue last night at my office, that's marketing, so I put that marketing non-subscription. Point is, I set up my chart of accounts to match the way that I do business. Don't, I mean, you should listen to your accountant, but at the end of the day, your chart of accounts should match how you do business so that it makes it easier for you to reconcile your accounts. Um, and then make sure, uh, well, assuming you accept online payments, integrate with Stripe or PayPal or Square or one of the online payment platforms so that you don't have to do all that yourself. You don't want to be dealing with PCI compliance. Um, and then the last thing is, if you have employees, uh, use a good payroll provider. I really like Gusto. Um, if you have an S-Corp, for example, you, you, need, you probably you need to do payroll for yourself, and you can either have your accountant do that for you, or you can do it yourself using a software like Gusto. So I pay Gusto, I think it's $35 a month, because uh, I'm also an S-Corp, uh, so that I can manage my payroll through there. And I, when I had employees in the past, I paid them through there. You can also use Gusto to pay your subcontractors, but honestly, it may not be worth the money unless you use your subcontractors on a recurring basis. If it's just one-off projects, it may not be a worth, a worth it. Yeah, on the right. Uh, this is just a quick thing. And if you, if you set up as a quick, uh, as an S-Corp or something like that, you have different uh, retirement uh, options also, right? Retirement accounts. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid and... Well, let's say like you could do, a, you could do like a 401k or something like that if you end up setting up an escort and actually start paying yourself. I don't know that side of it. Okay, never mind. There are a lot of tax benefits to being an S corp. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to get into those today because it's kind of complicated. Uh, if you make more than 
So it depends on your industry, but uh, if you make more than 50 to 75 ish grand, right, and, uh, and, and most of that is profit if you have high margins, uh, you should look into doing an S Corp. Uh, that's, you should talk to an accountant about it. They can run your numbers to see if there's a tax savings there. That's usually around where the cutoff is. Yeah. You said, you mentioned zero.com and what was the other one? FreshBooks. FreshBooks? Yeah, FreshBooks.com. That's a little more fun. Zero is a little more accounting based. FreshBooks is a little more creative based. They do the exact same thing though. And their fees are more or less the same. Um, also, if you go to my website, VentureLegalKC.com, in the upper right corner, there's an orange button that says free resources. And then on the right sidebar, there's a um, thing that says uh, resource guide. A lot of these links that I'm talking about are actually in that resource guide on my website. Um, okay, so business tax 101. Uh, there's basically two ways that the IRS will tax you. One is pass-through and one is double tax. Most businesses in America are going to be pass-through entities. These are sole proprietorships, LLCs, and S-Corps. The idea being, so you see the white box around the cafe. Cafe makes $100,000. Uh, that money, assuming it's all profit, gets div divided up between that man and woman up there, 50-50. The woman will represent uh, and, and um, report $50,000 of income on her personal tax return. The guy would, I should give these people names, uh, the guy would also report $50,000 on his personal tax return. The business itself, the cafe, will not have a tax liability under the first uh, system of taxation. Uh, the money literally passes through the company and goes to the individuals they pay on their personal tax return at whatever personal tax rate they might have. Right. So if, if the woman is married to a guy that uh, puts them in a really high income tax bracket, um, she might pay taxes on that hundred thousand dollars at a forty percent tax rate. If that man is married to a girl that uh, maybe maybe his wife doesn't work, so their income is lower, so um, uh, they might pay taxes at a ten or twenty percent tax bracket, right? So it's kind of unfair actually, but the point is it passes through to the people. Um, the other way you could do it is called double tax. And the only real company that pays double tax for the most part is going to be corporations. What happens there is if that cafe brings in $100,000 of profit, they're going to pay a tax, income tax on that profit, so say 25%. So then they are left over with $75,000. Then they distribute that money out to the shareholders, in this case, man and woman, and they both represent uh, half of 75 grand on their personal tax return, uh, and they have to pay taxes on that again, right? So double taxation. It sounds really stupid. There's various reasons why you would be a corporation and why you would set it up that way, but for the most part, freelancers like you guys would not choose that. If you choose to be a corporation, you can make an S-corp election and bump yourself back up to the pass-through taxation. That's what people did for years. Uh, up until um, up until 1998, that was what everybody did. Uh, from like 1950 to 1998, everybody did that. And then in 1998, the IRS did this little weird thing and allowed you to make that election through an LLC. And then ever since 1998, most companies have been creating LLCs as opposed to corporations. Um, so how do you pay your taxes? Here's the big kicker. Big kicker. So. First, save uh, 15 to 30% of your profit. If you want to know a more accurate answer, talk to your accountant. They can help you kind of figure out what the right percentage is. Take that money and put it into a special savings account somewhere so you don't touch it, so you don't forget about it. Uh, and then pay estimated taxes quarterly. Again, you should talk to an accountant to figure out how much you should pay and where you need to pay it to. But the point is you should pay every three months. Actually, it's not every three months. It's like, it's like April and then July or something. It's weird. Um, but you pay four times a year. And then at the end of the year, you will attach a Schedule C to your annual tax return. If for whatever reason you have uh, an S Corp or if you're a partnership, you'll get a K-1 instead of a Schedule C, but they're basically the same thing. This Schedule C will say you have X number of dollars of taxable income that you need to pay. At the end of the year, if you did not pay enough in estimated payments, you'll have to pay more money to the IRS. If you overpaid, you'll get a refund from the IRS. Um, if you don't pay your estimated taxes, the IRS will uh, assess a penalty. I think it's 1% of whatever you owed. So it's not a significant amount of money, but it still adds up. Um, and I'll be honest, I didn't pay my quarterly estimated taxes one year, just, just never got around to it. <laughs> so I, I paid the 1%. Um, yeah? So in Kansas, uh, I know finally, if I have an LLC pass through and I pay taxes for myself, on the annual filing, it asks if the company had made a profit. And if you say yes, then it wants a taxi. So if I'm paying taxes for myself and it's a pass-through, should I always say no? 
I'm not following you there, but uh, this might answer your question. The LLC, if you're taxed as a sole proprietor, which you probably are, the LLC will never pay a tax liability. It might pay sales taxes and other stuff, but it won't pay an income tax liability. Yeah, I suppose it's possible you could pay your tax liability through your LLC, but that would be weird. Uh, maybe an accountant could do that for you. I don't know. I'm not an accountant. I'm just a lawyer. Um, does that help? Okay. Um, okay, so that's paying taxes, managing finances. Before we move on, any questions on that stuff? Okay. Uh, now we're going to get into some really, really important things. Uh, intellectual Property 101. Uh, oh, yeah, I do have an ebook on this one, too. So, uh, same link, venture case or venturelegalkc.com forward slash ebooks. I have a whole 30 page ebook dealing with IP issues. Um, there's four basic types of IP. This is really, really, really important for all of you because you're creative freelancers. Uh, I mean, you all pretty much make websites, right? I mean, that's the whole point of this conference. Yeah, so this is a really big deal for all of you. Um, uh, first one, which is the most important, and I'll talk more about this one, um, is copyright law. Copyrights will protect creative works. Creative works is a pretty broad category. It includes uh, uh, websites and graphic design type work. It also includes things like uh, business documents, presentations, like I could copyright this presentation. Um, even boring stuff. I mean, you could use copyrights to protect um, like uh, marketing plans and um, uh, business plans and business outlines and so on. Uh, those will last typically 70 years past the life of the author, so it's a pretty long period of time. Uh, those uh, That 70 year time period is coming up for expiration for Mickey Mouse soon, so it will probably be extended because Disney is always the company that extends that they have the money, they lobby Congress and get it done. Trademarks will protect your branding, so to the extent you have a name or a logo, you can use a trademark to protect it. To the extent that you're helping your clients make their branding elements, they might want some help with protecting it. Um, you can protect uh, names, slogans, logos. Um, to some extent, you can protect colors and scents. The key there is... Um, well, the smart thing to do is go to registration with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, but you don't actually have to do that. As soon as you use a mark in commerce, you have rights in that name. Uh, but you're always better off getting a registration. Um, it's always goods and services specific. So if I have, well, so my marketing company is called Be Legal Marketing. So um, aside from the fact that I probably can't own the phrase legal, I could probably own the logo that we created, but it's only going to apply to website design. So if somebody wanted to go up and open a, a restaurant called Be Legal Marketing, food for some stupid reason, they could do that. And there's nothing I could really do to stop them from doing that. Conversely, if I wanted to open up a web design company and call it McDonald's, probably couldn't do that. McDonald's is known as a famous mark and they're so big and so powerful that they would almost certainly be able to shut you down. Um, don't know why you would do that, but... Um, that's true if your last name was McDonald. And there's some, there's some interesting law stuff out there about what happens if it's your name. Our town um, has a McDonald's restaurant, a McDonald's vacuum and sewing machine, and a McDonald's computer repair shop. Really? Yes. Are they small? The two shops are. The yeah. restaurants, obviously not. Well, sure. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, if you're small enough, they may not come after you. Um, but they, they have a lot of power to be able to shut down stuff. Have you guys seen the movie um, Coming to America with Eddie Murphy from the 80s? It's an awesome movie. It's a lawyer's dream movie. Um, uh, okay, so the, the important thing I mentioned is get a registration with the USPTO. You don't have to do this, but it's a good idea. Uh, they cost $225 to file their application. I usually recommend you use an attorney for this because if you screw it up, it can take a long time to fix if you can fix it at all. And they're so slow that you won't even learn you screwed it up for three or four months. Um, uh, so that's 225 Associated with that, you'd probably do a trademark search. The company I use, they charge $138. And then my legal fees are usually about 800 bucks when I do it. So the point is, when you do a trademark application, it's usually about $1,200, $1,300. But it's money well spent, in my opinion, because once you have the registration, you have really good rights in your name. Plus, that applies nationwide. So if you want to sell websites across the entire country, it makes a lot of sense to get a registration. Yeah? What's the difference between like a patent pending and like a patent that's confirmed? Like, why do people kind of like not care if it's pending and like it's a big deal if it's if you earned it or whatever, you know? Like, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll jump ahead of patent since you asked. Uh, patent pending just means that you filed your application and it's pending with, I mean, hence the name, it's pending with the USPTO. Um, I don't know if I'd say people don't care about it. If I saw patent pending, I would care. The difference being if it hasn't registered yet, then it may not ever register. So maybe somebody could still get around your patent. Once you get the patent, patents are pretty powerful. The downside is they take a long time to register. They cost a lot of money to register. Um, and they only last for like 20 years. So 
Patents are really powerful if you're like Apple and Samsung and all these big companies. For you guys, it really doesn't matter that much. Point is, patents protect inventions. You guys really are not inventing much. You might invent a um, algorithm or something which you might be able to patent, but that's questionable right now. Uh, most of what you all are creating is going to be copyright and trade secret. To some extent, you also might, or I'm sorry, copyright and trademark. To some extent, you might create something that is a trade secret, um, and your clients will almost certainly be giving you information of theirs that is a trade secret, and they might want you to sign like a non disclosure agreement to protect it. Um, generally speaking, if they ask you to sign one, you're going to have to sign it. You just want to make sure you review it to make sure you understand what it says, uh, make sure it's not overly restrictive. Um, you might also have trade secrets. Um, you know, and how you design your websites or uh, what you do on the back end of your website that is unique to you and that you don't want to get out. So you might have your client sign a non-disclosure agreement to protect you as well if you have confidential information. Um, so of all of these issues, the one that I want to come back to is copyright and specifically who owns the copyright. Um, the default rule is that whoever creates something will be the owner of that copyright. Um, so if I make a website, or no, for example, I made this prior, or this uh, Google presentation, so I own the copyright in this website, right? There's three ways that somebody else might own that copyright, and this is really important for you guys to all understand. So the first one's pretty easy. You transfer it in writing. So if I get out a piece of paper and I write down, Chris Brown transfers this slide deck to you, and you pay me 10 bucks and we both sign it, you own the copyright. That's easy. The next one is kind of easy also. It's created by an employee. So in this case, I'm technically an employee of Venture Legal, and anything that I create within my scope of employment will be owned by my law firm. So Venture Legal actually owns this slide deck. Um, but only if it's within my employment. So if I go out and make a website for a client through my other company, Venture Legal does not employ me to make websites. They employ me to practice law. So that website would not be owned by my law firm. Um, the last area is the one that's the most confusing, and it's the one that probably matters the most to all of you because you are all independent contractors. Uh, the only way that your client will own the works that you're creating is if you have a written contract with them that transfers ownership to them, or if it's called a work made for hire in that contract. Interestingly, works made for hire has a very specific definition in the Copyright Act, and it requires a written document. So it still comes back to the writing. So this is really great for you because if you create something for your client and you don't have a written contract, you actually own that work, which is cool because if they don't pay you, you could sue them or threaten to sue them for copyright infringement. Um, to the extent that you have subcontractors doing work for you, the opposite applies. They will own the works that they're making unless you capture ownership in writing. Right, so if you get a big contract for Hallmark to make a bunch of marketing materials or to make a new website for Hallmark and you hire 10 subcontractors and you don't get anything in writing with them, you won't be able to transfer ownership to Hallmark because you don't own it. And that's a recipe for disaster. Um, so always use subcontractor agreements with your contractors. You should also use contracts with your clients and that client would be smart to make you have a provision that says they own everything you make. If you do that, which is normal, you should also put in there an exception that says if they don't pay you, they don't own it. Right? And that way if they fail to pay you for whatever reason, you can hold back the website, you can threaten to sue them for copyright infringement and so on. It's a really good benefit to you. Uh, and I'll come back to a little bit of this when I talk about contracts and, and employees. Uh, any questions on intellectual property before we move on? Yeah. I did have one question. If you know, like, say you have a client that um, wants to be like their logo and brand nationwide, yeah, but it infringes on somebody who is just registered in, like, say, Kansas. What do you like? How does that work? Um, when you say registered, you mean like their business name is registered? Yeah, like I worked for a company. They're only registered in Kansas, mm -hmm. but there's other companies with the same name yeah. in other states and nationwide. Yeah, so there's two components there. One is your business registration, getting back to the very first thing I talked about, registering with the Secretary of State. All that that's doing is telling the Secretary of State, I'm doing business under this name. It doesn't give you any trademark protection whatsoever. Um, so somebody else could come into Missouri and open up a Venture Legals with an S on the end, and the Secretary of State would be fine with that. They don't care, because it's different. They could say Venture Legal 
the number one comma LLC, and the Secretary of State would be fine with that. Now what if they use no. almost identical logo to you? So that gets into trademark, right? So you've got the business registration on one side, which is kind of irrelevant here. Trademark is what really matters. So I use the phrase venture legal in Kansas and Missouri. Um, almost exclusively. So if I didn't have a registration, I would only be able to protect it in the states that I already do business in, and to some extent, states that I might expand to. So maybe Colorado or Iowa or something. Um, so your rights only extend to the area that you're already using the name. That's called a common law trademark. However, I got a federal registration on my trademark, so now I have that mark, actually that mark with a tagline. Um, registered with the USPTO, so I have nationwide rights. So if anybody were to use that, um, or anything substantially similar to that, um, I would be able to shut them down. Um, so the issue that you run into there is just kind of a practical one. If you find somebody who's using a mark and your client wants to do it, really it's obviously it's a call for your client, not for you. And you don't have to give them, well you shouldn't give them legal advice. Uh, you should just tell them to go talk to a lawyer. But what they need to do is figure out does that other company first, do they have a registration with the USPTO? If they do, then you should probably not adopt that name. Are the, is that other company expanding or likely to expand into your area? And if they're not, well, maybe you can use it. But if you want to expand into their area, you're going to have an issue. So it may not be worth it. Um, and, and then just practical considerations of, like, do they already have good rankings on SEO and stuff? And what kind of issues are you going to have? Um, generally speaking, the more arbitrary of a name you can pick, the better it's going to be. But arbitrary is hard because arbitrary is... I mean, it's just hard to connect your new business to a product if your name is arbitrary. But that's the best for trademark purposes. Um, okay, let's talk about employment issues real quick. So there's two ways that you can hire people or there's two ways that you might perform services for other people. One is being an employee, the other is being an independent contractor. That's it, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it vendor, subcontractor, supplier, whatever. Um, you're going to be one of these two. Ultimately, the IRS has final say over how you classify your employees and how you will be classified if you're working for somebody else. Uh, and it comes down to these basic five categories and a few others. Uh, so first one is control. So to the extent that they have control over how you do your services, uh, if they say show up from nine to five, sit in this cubicle, here's your computer and so on, and they have a lot of control over how you work and when you work and where you work, then you're more likely to be an employee. Uh, if you use somebody else's equipment, you're more likely to be an employee, right? So um, me, as a lawyer, I have my own computer, I have my own office, I have my own pens and paper and all that stuff. Makes me more like an independent contractor. Right? Uh, third is payment. If you pay somebody like a regular salary, or even if you get payment as an independent contractor, but you get paid like a certain salary every week, it looks like an employment relationship and the IRS might call you an employee. Um, whereas if you get paid like on a project basis, you know, 50% down, 50% at the end or something, you're more likely to be an independent contractor. Uh, benefits, obviously if your client's giving you any kind of employment style benefits like healthcare or more likely like paid time off or something like that, you're more likely to be deemed an employee. Last is term and termination. So the more that you just kind of work, you know, five hours a week, every week forever, and either party can terminate any day, the more likely you are to be an employee. If your contract says something like you have to give 30 days notice before you can terminate, um, and it's not so much a weekly thing, but just kind of project-based, then you're more likely to be an independent contractor. Now, why does this matter, right? So one is tax responsibilities, and I'll come back to that. The other is copyright, which I talked about earlier. If you have an employee working for you, you'll own everything that they create within their scope of employment, which is great. If you have an independent contractor working for you, you don't own it. So that's obviously a big deal. And then flip that for when you're working for somebody else. The other area and why it's hugely important is tax issues. So if you have employees, you have to do employer withholdings. You have to withhold part of their income for income taxes, as well as their portion of employment taxes. And then you also have to pay a part of their income, uh, a percentage of their income in taxes as well, so it's more expensive for you. Uh, and then you have to issue them a W-2 at the end of every year. Um, that's probably largely irrelevant for most of you because you're probably not an employee of somebody and you probably don't hire employees. You're more likely to hire contractors and you are a contractor of your client. So what matters more for you is the second part here. Uh, contractors are responsible for their own income tax uh, liabilities. So when your client hires you, they don't have to do anything for tax. Uh, they have to possibly give you a 10 and a 9, which I'll come back to you, but otherwise they don't do anything. You are responsible for paying all of your own taxes. So if you go, go back to that slide I was talking about where I said you need to save and pay and attach and so on, that's what I'm talking about. Um, 
W-9s and 1099s come into play here if your client pays you more than $600 uh, in one year or for you if you pay a subcontractor more than $600 in one year. If that happens, then you have to give a W-9, uh, you have to do a W-9 and 1099 exchange. The purpose there is, um, say your client pays you $1,000 to make a landing page and they give you a thousand dollars cash right in theory you could take that put it in your pocket and never even tell the irs about it right but the irs doesn't like that the irs wants to know that you got paid because they want to tax you on that income so what happens is the irs says okay business you paid that freelancer a thousand bucks now you need to give us what's called a 1099 and tell us that you made that payment that 1099 will have your name on it and a thousand dollars the irs will then go look up your tax return and see did they report that thousand dollars or not Right, so in order for them to give you that 1099, you have to give them a W-9, which is a one-page form that you put your name and EIN and address on. It's pretty simple. Uh, and then they use that information to create the 1099. 1099s are kind of a pain in the ass if you hire a bunch of contractors. Um, but for your side of it, if all you're doing is work for other people and you don't have subcontractors, all you have to do is the W-9. And if your client doesn't ask you for it, it's not your fault. If they don't file the 1099, it's not your fault. What is your fault is if you don't report the income. So don't do that. If somebody pays you, put it on your tax return, report it as income, and pay taxes on it. Uh, that's a really good way to end up in jail is if you don't report your income. Um, okay, is that helpful? Any questions on that? Yeah. Uh, you said under $600. So, um, you know, say I'm, I'm just starting out, I'm doing like $100, $200 jobs. Mm -hmm. Would I still have to report that? Uh, you, you mean that they're paying you that money? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. People. Yeah, you have to report any money that comes into you for services. It doesn't matter if it's a dollar or a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, so the second part about working with subcontractors is your agreement with them. Uh, you should always get a, an agreement in writing with your subcontractors. Number one reason being intellectual property. You want to make sure that you capture ownership of whatever they're creating for you. Uh, from there, uh, there's a bunch of reasons why you want to have it for payment and liability and other issues. But here's the big ones. Uh, anytime that you're hiring somebody, uh, consider the termination rights to see how you can fire them and also how they can quit. And also consider that if you're hiring them to work for you on a project for a client and that client has some kind of a termination right, you want to make sure that you can get out of paying them or at least terminate early if your client cancels on you. So always think through those two. And how they relate. Uh, always look at intellectual property to make sure you know who owns the uh, IP that's being created. Always look at non-disclosure obligations for confidentiality in case there are issues of actual confidential information going back and forth. And then also consider non-solicitation provisions. Um, you might want a provision there that says that your subcontractor cannot go straight to your client without going through you while they're working for you and maybe for one or two years afterwards. Because um, that's that'd be unfortunate for you. Yeah. Do you have to have a, a sample subcontract agreement, especially in dealing with like, like the intellectual property issues? No, um, but I do have a little surprise at the end I'll show you. I shouldn't call it a surprise. It's really not that cool for you, but uh, a little self plug that I'll show you at the end for a company that I created to help with this issue. Yeah, I'm thinking of like uh, we deal with building or um, subcontracting someone to build those logos for a couple hundred bucks, and then I'm thinking, well, technically I don't know that. Yeah, yeah, and that could be an issue. Um, no, what I typically do for clients is we sit down for like freelancer clients. I usually charge five to six hundred dollars. I do a lot of work on fixed fees. I don't like charging hourly, so I'll say you know it's usually five to six hundred dollars. And we sit down for an hour and we talk through how do you do your services, and then I go back and I create a template that you can then reuse with clients. That's how I typically do it. But I, I'm, I created a new company to help freelancers with contracts, and I'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I worked for. Uh, one of the paint party places. I only got paid to teach classes, but they also supplied paint and a canvas for me to come up with ideas, which I painted on my own time to teach the classes. So I owned the copyrights because basically they didn't have a contract or I didn't sign a contract, but who owns that painting? If I create a painting that's got my copyright uh -huh. on the painting. Oh, good question. Yeah. yeah, so the actual object itself is separate from the copyright. Right. right. So um, a good example of that is when you when you used to buy CDs. I used to buy CDs when I was a kid. Uh, I would own that CD. I could do whatever I wanted with that CD. I could sell it to you. I could transfer it. I could shatter. I could do whatever I want with it. It's an object, right? Um, but I don't own the underlying copyright, so I can't copy it. So when Napster came along and everybody started importing all those songs from those CDs, that was illegal because you can't copy the CD. You can't create derivative works from it. You can't 
play the CD out in public and have a free concert, right? Because that violates the copyright. But the CD itself, that one copy, I owned, I could do whatever I wanted with. So back to your point, they could do whatever they want with that painting, um, but they don't un own the underlying uh, copyright to the painting. So they can't make copies and so, so on. So even though it took my time and effort to put the painting on the canvas, without pay, Oh, without pay. Well, it depends on whatever you're... They need to make the painting. They yeah. need to pay me to teach the class. Uh, well, then in theory, you might own the actual painting itself. Okay. That gets into the specifics of that contract. Okay. If you had a contract. Um, there was no contract. Yeah, so... They ended up with a bunch of my paintings. You would have a good case that you own those and would get them back. But it kind of, there's a lot of really fact-specific things you'd have to go through. So I didn't get paid for any of my time to create that idea for the copyright or to put the painting on the canvas. Yeah. Um, before this class that I was going to teach, you know. Yeah, you you would need to talk to a lawyer or me about that because um, <laughs> the specifics are hugely important there yeah. in terms of who actually owns that physical painting. I'm so. sure the paintings are probably gone by now, but it, it, if I came up into that situation again, I'd like to know. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, okay, last area that I'm going to talk through is contracts. I also have an ebook on this. Uh, same link as before. Uh, so, why should you use contracts? Uh, the number one reason that I like to say is that it creates better deals and better relationships between you and your clients. A lot of people hate using contracts. I get it, but it really does help you. Uh, it also helps you to minimize risks and it also helps you to improve dispute resolution if you get into a dispute with your client. 70% uh, of freelancers have been stiffed, so disputes happen quite a bit. You will have, inevitably, you will get stiffed. Um, uh, but what is a contract? And this is something that kind of surprises people. There's only three parts to it. One, an offer to do something. Uh, two, acceptance of that offer. And then three, what lawyers call consideration, which is just something of value. So if I say, will you paint my house? That's the offer. Uh, if you say, sure, I'll do that. Or say I say, will you paint it for $10,000? And you say, sure, I'll paint your house for $10,000. Uh, that was offered. That was acceptance. And then the consideration is me giving you ten grand is my consideration. You showing up and painting the house is your consideration. Boom, you have a contract. It doesn't have to be in writing. Um, so uh, oral contracts, for the most part, are enforceable. There are some exceptions on that, though. Um, well, actually, before I even get into that, I should say uh, don't rely on oral contracts because they're uncertain. Who knows what the terms are? Both parties probably have their own interpretation of what the terms are. To the extent you do rely on an oral contract, always send a follow-up email after you talk to the person and say, hey, just to confirm our deal, I'm going to paint your house and you're going to pay me ten grand. That way you have some record of it. And, and ask for them to respond. Um, some contracts, however, do have to be in writing. So like marriage licenses, or not marriage licenses, marriage... Um, what do you call when you sign a contract with your spouse? A prenup. <laughs> prenup. Prenups have to be in writing. Real estate deeds have to be in writing. Certain things have to be in writing. Service contracts don't have to be. Um, and then also sometimes you do need special language to use. Like uh, in a real estate deed, the language matters a lot. In a service contract, like you're, what you're doing, the language doesn't matter as much in terms of enforceability. Uh, what you might want to do with your clients and your subcontractors is use the MSA and SOW format. What that means is you'll sign an MSA that might be, say, five or six pages long, and it covers all the basic uh, and complicated legal issues. But it doesn't actually say what either party is going to do in terms of payment or services. And then you might sign multiple statements of work, or you call it a uh, scope of work. That's going to talk about what are you doing building a website and how much and when do they have to pay you and the beauty here is that your statement of work could be one page and you might attach a proposal or an outline or something but the statements of work then could be signed a lot quicker because you don't have to go back and look at all those legal terms again the important thing to do here is make sure your statement of work references back to the master service agreement um, how to review a contract, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, inevitably, your clients will give you a contract and you'll have to take a look at it. So the thing that you want to do is always understand what you want and need out of the contract. Typically, it's payment. Uh, also understand what they want and need out of that contract. So they might have some very specific things that they need. Um, you always need to read it, all of it, seriously, all of it, read it. Uh, it's important because there's just always things in there that you might skim over, but they're really a big deal. And once you've signed it, you can get stuck into something that you don't want to be stuck into. To. Um, if you don't understand something about what is in there, ask the other party. Like, if they have something like an insurance requirement that you're like, why do you want me to have commercial auto liability insurance? Ask them why, and they'll either have a good reason or maybe they don't have a good reason, and they say, oh, yeah, we can take that out. A lot of times it's just miscommunication is why things are in there. And then also negotiate when appropriate. Always be willing to negotiate. Now, if you have a contract with... Uh, Cerner, for example, you're probably not going to be able to negotiate much. It's just the way it is. But if you have a 
um, a contract to build a website for a coffee shop down the street, you probably have a lot of room to negotiate. Um, I have a contract review checklist in that ebook. I'm not going to go through it. I just want to let you know that it's there. Uh, it's really helpful that you can kind of just kind of go through line by line to see what all is in uh, the contract that somebody gives you. Um, the last thing on contracts, I think it's the last thing, is how to sign a contract. So if you're working on your own, you sign it as an individual. You just print your name. Pretty easy. If you are operating under an LLC or a corporation, you absolutely want to follow that format on the right. Print your company name, sign your name, print your name, print your title. By doing that, that makes that contract a contract between the other party and your company and not the other party and you as an individual. If you accidentally sign it as an individual and you have an LLC, you might be subjecting yourself to personal liability for everything under that contract. So it's really actually pretty easy, but it's also really easy to mess up. Um, I think that's it. Okay, so here's my surprise. Uh, I created a company recently. It's called Contract Canvas. The idea is to make it really easy for freelancers to create their own contracts online. We're creating what we call a human contract that has icons and plain English on it, where you and your client can create this contract online in about five or ten minutes, sign the contract online, and then underneath that contract are the formal legal terms. So it's fully backed up by a typical contract that a lawyer or a judge would see. So we haven't released this yet, but we are going to do free beta access specifically for people in Kansas City. Uh, so if you want to sign up, you can. Just go to contractcanvas.com, click on beta access, and type in your email. Um, it's not free, but it's going to be a lot cheaper than hiring a lawyer. Um, okay, that's everything. Um, real quick, I want to make a note. I'm talking at the WordPress KC Meetup on May 8th at Harpo's. I haven't been there since law school, so this will be fun. Um, we're going to talk about uh, legal issues. A lot of the same stuff is here, but it's going to be more of a Q&A roundtable discussion and not so much of a presentation. Um, here's my contact info, so you can shoot me an email, tweet at me, um, or go to my website. I've got a bunch of info there. So that's exactly 50 minutes. I'm happy to take questions as a group or uh, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever you prefer. Any questions for the group? Yeah. Um, I don't know about Wyoming. A lot of people pick Delaware for various reasons. Um, if you want to maintain your privacy, you can do that in almost every state if you pick LLC and have a lawyer do it for you. So for example, if you hired me to create a Missouri or Kansas LLC, I could do it and I don't have to put your name anywhere on there. It would be my name and then the only thing you have to have is a registered agent, so you'd have to pay a company to serve for you, but then your name won't be on there anywhere. You don't come up as on the board or any of that? So LLCs don't have directors or officers, and so you don't have to report that. If you form a corporation in Kansas, and I think it's the same in Missouri, you have to list your directors and your officers. So there it becomes an issue. And in Kansas, uh, for corporations in Kansas, you have to list any shareholder above 5%. And now that I think about it, there's a, there's a minor chance that you have to do that for LLCs, but I don't think so. I don't yeah, foul. My understanding is there were just certain states that. Yeah, yeah. Delaware for sure. Yeah. Delaware, you can hide everything in Delaware, which is okay. So here's a really funny side story. Um, Trump's lawyer, the whole like porn star payment thing, right? He formed an LLC in Delaware to get, I assume, to get privacy. He put his name on there, and I'm like, dude, <laughs> if you're trying to do this and not uh, get your name out there. You, it's like law school 101. Like, come on. So if <laughs> anyway. you don't have your name on there, how do you prove ownership of that company? How does, how does that work? Uh, certified documents, just oh, okay. signing documents that lawyers can prepare for you. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Anyway, I don't mean to harp on Trump so much, but uh, <laughs> this, this stuff that's been going on has been hilarious from a uh, legal ethics standpoint. You're uh, lawyer, not Trump. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, or both, I don't know, anyway. It's just, as a lawyer watching this stuff happen, like ignoring all the political and, and ethical and societal issues, ignoring all that, watching all the legal ethics stuff that's been happening recently has just been amazing, because this doesn't happen very often. Um, so, yeah. So I kind of missed the slide that said, if you need an LLC, I didn't get a picture of that one. Mm -hmm. So what's that line where you go from just doing some crafts and selling them what they call a hobby. What's that line, or is there a certain income that you cross over, I guess, or it's more about the liability, probably, whenever you decide that you need an LLC? Um, so this one you're talking about? 
either that one or the one before it. Uh, probably this one. Um, the, the biggest thing is if you have people doing services for you. Because if you have another person doing anything for you as an employee or as a subcontractor, then you're subjecting yourself to liability for anything that they do. By forming an LLC, you can, you can shield yourself from personal liability. That's really the biggest one. The rest of them are not as important, but they're still important to some degree. If you want to grow your company and add owners, like you can't add owners of yourself, right? You can only do that in a company. Um, it helps your clients because your clients will be able to call you an LLC and not a human, and therefore it helps them with the reclassification audit if they were to get audited. And then the last one, it just helps you look like a more of a business. Yeah. Um, what's that like threshold that you mentioned, like between the, you know, like between that S corp and an LLC? Like, oh yeah. Um, so the benefit of forming an S corp is you can avoid paying 15% of taxes on a certain chunk of your income, uh, but it only applies once you make more than a reasonable salary. Now the reasonable salary changes for different professions in different cities and states and so on. Uh, typically uh, the cutoff is usually around 75 grand kind of as an average, but it really depends. Um, you have to talk to an accountant to see if the numbers make sense for you. So, so you would say like uh, if a person is starting uh, you know, a service or you know, trying to build websites and stuff mm -hmm. and you, know, he, you got to that um, threshold, 75 grand or yeah. however much it is, um, is it easy to switch from an LLC to an S corp? Or? Relatively easy. Okay. You, you can uh, make an S corp election. So an S corp is actually not a business, it's just a tax class is all. Okay. So you can make that election uh, the first two or three months that your company is alive, you can make it during that window, or you can make it the first two or three months every year. So you have to do it in that window. Uh, it's relatively easy to go into an S corp. However, if you become an S corp, you have to pay yourself a salary with, with holdings. You have to file an S corp tax return every year. And then there's also some complicated ownership issues if you have an S corp. So uh, if you're like a high growth startup, uh, you don't want to be an S corp. There's a bunch of issues with ownership. Uh, if you're a small business, a local small business, yeah, S corps can be really awesome. Only if, but only if you make enough money to justify it. Because if you don't make enough money to justify it, you're just gonna pay a bunch of extra fees to the to your accountant. You're gonna have to do the payroll stuff, which is just kind of a pain, and you'll actually end up making less money. There is a blog post, um, if you, if you Google VentureLegalKC.com or uh, uh, space um, S Corp, I have a three part blog post and the third part has a chart that actually outlines how the three different tax options work and it kind of helps you, but at the end of the day you have to talk to an accountant to see if you would save money. Okay. The last thing I'll say is once you become an S Corp, getting out of it is really hard from a tax perspective, so you don't want to make this decision lightly. Um, for me and my law firm, because I started it kind of as a side business, I didn't even make the election for the first three years because I wasn't sure if I was going to practice law forever. Okay. So, yeah. And I can't give you any specifics, but I know that you have different retirement options once you become an S corp versus being an LLC. I know that you have some more different options. Yeah, what I, I think. What I think you're getting at is if you form a corporation, you can do certain 401k savings plans through a corporation that you can't do through an LLC. Okay. But if you do a corporation, you don't want to be double taxed, so you would most likely make an S corp election as the corporation. Um, and then you could do it interesting. I think once you start paying yourself, once you start paying yourself on actual income, you know, earned income, then you have those other uh, retirement yeah. savings options. Yeah. That's, I think that's where it is. So, Probably so. So do you get this information from a lawyer, or is there another place you can do research? For the what they're talking about, I would go to an accountant. In the corporation? I, I would go to an accountant first, because okay. they can run your numbers. Yeah. Um, is that an S-corp within a corporation? Are you going to be like triple taxed at that point? No. So, um, okay. so uh, again, an S-corp is just a tax class. It's not a right. business, right? The only business entities that exist for purposes of this talk are LLCs and corporations. There's a lot more, but that's really all you would ever really pick. Um, once you've picked that, then uh, you can make the S Corp election uh, to choose to be taxed differently. Um, yeah. We have to wrap up. Security wants us out of the building at five. Oh no! <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. Okay. Um, I.